Ron, Lenny, Galen, and Susan. going to be Susan. a mechanism whereby investigators could get some of those serum samples, piece of those serum samples that you guys are going to be studying? I, I'm sorry, I didn't. Is there going to be a mechanism for investigators to get some of those serum samples to do some studies on? Yes, um, if there is an investigator that is interested in um, either um, the samples, the panels that we're putting together, yes, that would have to be go through a request through NHLBI, and Dr. Uh, Simone Glenn is the point of contact for that. Also, um, uh, NCI has been working on antibodies um, and for the serological assays, and um, they have made known that they would be willing to share their antibodies with other investigators. I'm just going to reverse the order, Lenny, because I was looking at you because I knew you were going to ask a question, so I'd probably miss somebody else. Susan, Galen, and then Lenny. And Hi. I just Michael. wanted to know if when you're taking uh, serum samples of patients and testing them for XMRV, do you, um, and let's say they're positive, do you, are you required to inform the, the person from whom, who's donated blood that they are positive, and how do you counsel them? That's really beyond. Um, I'm not privy to the institutional review board. I know that with the various repositories that we have, there are certain things put into place as far as um, uh, blinding the samples. But um, as far as the individuals that are already on the analytical panel and the clinical panel, panel these will be individuals that ha are already known to be, okay? So again, that has had to go through the IRB, and as you you can end, you can guess, that um, there has been a lot of questions concerning um, that, and that's why one of the delays that we've had. Mike, a very, uh, short question, and a little bit longer afterwards. In terms of basic policies, it was now, if I, as a, a, a healthy 60-year-old man, came to donate blood, and in the context of my uh, inquiry said that I'd had prostate cancer at 40 years of age that was adequately treated and had no trouble for 20 years, would I be, under current guidelines, would I be disqualified as a donor? That's a very good question, and most places have like a five-year deferral on right. cancer. Right. Um, if it's 20 years and you're, you're, you're cancer-free, um, there would be no restriction on you being a blood donor. The reason I ask the question is that some of us around the table still remember the HIV epidemic that, as it came in the early 80s until it was established that it had a viral etiology. And I, let me preface my comments by saying my, uh, I, I'm, I have a very healthy skepticism of the role that XMRV plays in this based upon the heterogeneity of the literature, but I also have a very open mind of finding out. Uh, I would just like to know, and this I don't mean this to be provocative, just for information, what is the, is the perceived consequence of, in the blood banking community, of erring on the side to eliminate donors with a history of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome until it's decided on one way or another with the argument that that's probably five to ten years away from anything very definitive? I'm just curious as to what the problem is of erring on the side of eliminating them as opposed to waiting until we have more information. Well. A very good question, and um, I think that that's a challenging question that we all have to face, and um, many, many of us are changing even our thinking process on that as we look at some of the data that is out there. Um, as you can tell by the countries that have already made their um, deferral, um, they really have not come out clear-cut. Okay? It's sort of a feel-good type of policy that at least they've done something for chronic fatigue. Um, it really depends on the person opening up in an interview and telling the interviewer the information. I, I do believe that as we see more information come forward, um, we will be proactive in our responses and not wait for the definitive. Um, I think that we are right now making sure that transfusion medicine physicians, that the blood bank world understands that we are investigating XMRV and the importance of the good health question. But I also, ha I, I shouldn't say but, I also have to say that we are meeting, um, we met last week with the AABB task force. The discussion came up on um, 
our, the, what should the statement be to chronic fatigue patients. Um, I think that there's um, other organizations. Next week I will be talking to the American Red Cross. And so um, I think that many of the blood organizations are very um, at the edge where they are very uh, um, interested in what's happening and also want to make sure that we do have the safe safety measures put into place. Thank you. Michael Lenny. Um, <clears throat> actually, I had a similar question uh, slash concern about donor deferral. And I realize it's a very complex issue, but um, you know, those of us that work on infectious disease um, are aware that disease is cyclical. So it seems um, with that in mind, if donors are going to be deferred um, because of their current fatigue, um, but not with a history of, of fatigue, um, that does seem uh, at face value a little contradictory. And, and once again, I'm aware that donor deferral policy is very complex. Um, but I think uh, I would echo uh, Galen Marshall's thoughts that given the possibility that XMRV's association with chronic fatigue may be confirmed, or may not, but given that it may, um, personally, um, <coughs> I, I, I think it's good that the uh, blood bank <coughs> communities are actively discussing this because, um, uh, especially as we know that Canada and Australia um, are deferring uh, donors who have had a history of fatigue and not just um, have current fatigue. So I, I guess I'm saying uh, it's probably best to be cautious at this point and, and expand that deferral policy if it's at all possible. Thank you. Thank you. Then Nancy. I, 